So who is in the mood for Christmas? Hmm? You excited? Yeah, I know. It's very difficult to live out the season of Advent when Christmas is getting so close. It's overwhelming. But, you know, the parishioners here at St. John Paul II are very disciplined people. You have been really making sure that you're living out the season of Advent, right? Very impressed. You haven't watched any Christmas movies, right? <laughs> you haven't listened to any Christmas songs? You didn't watch, you know, First Christmas or National Lampoon's Christmas Vacation yet? which is obviously a tradition every year. You know, there's another tradition that's recent to my family, and that's watching the great movie called Elf. Have you ever seen that movie? <laughs> there is a scene in Elf where at the very beginning, he's in the North Pole with Santa Claus and all the elves, and it seems like there's such a great harmony up there. It's like there's unity among all people and even all creatures. You think of Norbert coming out of the, <clears throat> the water saying, hey, buddy, right? It's like, man, I wish I had that type of harmony with all of the creatures of the world. And it's pretty fascinating to think about. And then the very next scene as he's going off to New York to go find his real biological father, if you've never seen the movie, he comes to encounter a raccoon. And... You know, Buddy, the elf, is, loves everything. He has like a childlike innocence. So he reaches out his arms in a very welcoming manner, and he says, he wants to get up from the raccoon. And then the raccoon jumps up and attacks him, right? And it's such a funny scene. But it touches on this very desire in the human person to have unity and peace, harmony, with all of creation, including all of the animals. Many of us are fascinated by the life of St. Francis, his interaction with animals. We remember that very famous account of the wolf of Gubbio, the neighboring town to Assisi, and how that wolf was terrorizing many people, and how St. Francis made friends with the wolf, right? and change the whole wolf's appetite. We think of St. Rita with the bees, or even St. Anthony of Padua preaching to the fishes and the fishes jumping out of the sea in response to his bold and holy proclamation. We're fascinated by this because these saints have shown us this integrity, this harmony, this peace in the world. And it is in contrast to what we ordinary people experience day in and day out in the world. And what is that? Raccoons jumping at us and attacking us. And the very chaos of the world comes encroaching in to our peaceful homes. Hmm? Well, the scriptures today in Isaiah give us the continuation of this mountaintop experience. And what happens on the mountain of the Lord today? We get these images of the harmony between creation. Let's go back to the first reading very briefly. Then the wolf shall be a guest of the lamb. Isn't that interesting? And then the leopard shall lie down with the kid. The calf and the young lion shall browse together with a little child to guide them. The cow and the bear shall be neighbors, and together their young shall rest. The lion shall eat hay like the ox. Now, if anybody knows me, they know the fact that I just absolutely love lions. But I'm a prudent man, so that when I go to Africa with Father Peter, I'm not going to go off into the jungle and try to hug a lion, right? Probably not a wise decision. But I do look forward to the eschatological reality where lions are eating hay and they become vegetarian. Because then I could hug a lion and be very close 
to the animal that I have the most affection for. Perhaps you have affection for animals. Dogs and cats are easy to love. Or maybe you're thinking of your husband. <laughs> maybe not as easy to love. <laughs> or maybe you're thinking of your pastor. Not as easy to love. In truth, each of us desire the innate hunger for unity, harmony, and peace. But in this life, we are constantly compromising that very state. Not only that our sinfulness contributes to the disharmony and the disturbance of peace, but the entire world does. And it comes crashing into your homes, into the very foundation of your lives by way of networks like CNN, Fox News, MSNBC, NBC, and all of the other news broadcasters. How often do you watch the news? Daily? How many people watch the news daily? Hmm? How many of you get pinged, young people, who don't watch the news, who are cable cutters? How many of you get pinged every day with some type of news, with just a headline? How many of you receive the good news, the scriptures, every single day? Open your Bible, receive the good news. Much less of a statistic. Much less of a statistic. In the Wall Street Journal, there was an article that was just recently written about the rising rates of suicide among young people. They correlate that to the fact that religion is not being passed down to them. And the importance of religion in the public square has been denounced. Because very strategically, the good news has no longer a place. And what does the good news reflect? Well, this is the season of Advent. And who is the main character of Advent? Who's the main character? What, what do we celebrate at Christmas, people? Hmm? What do we celebrate at Christmas? We celebrate who? Jesus. What do we celebrate about Jesus. It was his birthday, of course. <clears throat> very quick, right? Christmas, we know. But who is the very central person in the scriptures to the season of Advent? You don't know? That's a good answer. I'm going to tell you. Huh? Not Jesus. Not Mary. How did you know that? <laughs> you don't want to tell me? Did mommy whisper that in your ear? <laughs> <coughs> John the Baptist. Can you say that with me, kids? John the Baptist, right? So John the Baptist is the central person to this season. And what does John the Baptist preach to us? Repent. Turn your lives to God. Depart from your sinful ways and be sanctified. John the Baptist was a voice crying out in the desert. Where is that desert? He was baptizing in the mitzvah, the ritual cleansing, right? He was, he was offering this ritual cleansing to the people that would journey far from throughout Judea and the Galilee all the way down to the desert. Have you ever been to the Holy Land? That's a long trip to the desert. And you have to go down toward what? The Dead Sea. Do you know why it's the Dead Sea? Do you know what ancient city was at the very depths of this world, right next to the Dead Sea, when it was a plush paradise and a fertile land? Do you know what city it was? Sodom and Gomorrah. And the surrounding cities that were destroyed 
by fire and brimstone. Hmm? Isn't that interesting? That John would be with the community like the Essenes, living penitential lives, awaiting the coming of the Messiah to save them from their sins and to redeem them and set them free. They are there repenting from their sins. Right there at the very location of the desert when all of those plush cities, and we're talking about like New York City, Chicago, L.A. type of a city. Everybody wanted to go there. And even still today, people want to go to the Dead Sea and rub themselves in mud. They could care less about Jerusalem. They could care less about the fact that Jesus walked around those, those streets. They just want the, the, uh, <laughs> the element-rich you know, dirt to bathe themselves in for a newer, younger, fresher-looking shell to their body. Right? This is a place of penance. And if St. John the Baptist is the very person of this season, what do you think this season is about? Have a holly jolly advent. It's the best time of the year. Right? Or is it something more than that? It is putting on the very discipline of harmony that can only come through the discipline of the senses. Opening our senses to the greater news and the greater presence of God in our midst. Literally, stopping the powers of the world encroaching into your homes. Pulling the plug on sinfulness. Pulling the plug on being filled with sinfulness. Whether it's your own sinfulness or you become an addict to other people's sinfulness, it is coming into your life and coming into your homes every single day. <clears throat> I'm on the younger people, my people, right? My generation. You know what we watch on television to make ourselves feel better about our terrible lives? We watch Desperate Housewives. <laughs> oh, and I see some of you older ladies sitting there like a little glimmer in your eyes. Hmm? We thirst on disorder, much more prominent disorder than our own, so we could feel stabilized. Does that give us true stability? Does that give us a real sense of, I'm okay? My life isn't that screwed up? Or should we be drawing our stability for something more? Because if we continue to walk down that path, and the path that the world has in store for us, and all of the things that are flooding our mind every single day, we walk in the very direction of our young people because we lose contact with the good news that there is hope for our lives and there is prosperity and there is a harmony at the end of this life if we commit ourselves and we are disciplined to living in communion with Christ and living righteous lives. Living in the disposition of constantly welcoming, like Buddy the Elf, all of creation. Whether it attacks us or not, we will continue to be of the disposition of welcome. This is why in the second reading, we hear St. Paul to the Romans in the 15th chapter say to us, welcome one another as Christ welcomed you. Look at the very arms of Jesus Christ on the cross. Looking like Buddy the Elf. Open. To receive, open to welcome, open to love.
And we sit there and watch our news broadcast, look at our phones, and we respond with great sense of alarm. We look at our children and our children's children departing from the very faith that has given us stability and we are filled with alarm. Thank you for the emphasis, buddy. What are we doing? What are we doing to experience the very good news that can fill us with peace and harmony. Why in the world, before there were Mercedes cheroots and buses that come from Jerusalem all the way down, that these people had to walk to the Dead Sea, through the desert, to the very mouth of the Jordan, into that arid territory? What motivated them was they wanted to get close to a holy person because they had something that they desired because they lived in the same world that you did and that you do. You are called to be the saints and you will not transmit the faith to your children if you have no peace. Disturbed and constantly ready to attack and fight. It will never happen. My sister doesn't go to church. She sent me a, she sent me a, an, a gif about mom trying to get us to church on Sunday. <laughs> and I look back at that and I think of my mom trying to get me to church. I was just like a rebellious kid. I'm like, I'm not going to go. She said the picture of like a monster, like, rah, right? She's still trying to get over that. We must share from the very peace that comes from the gospel of Jesus Christ and our communion with him with all people. And this is what St. Paul is encouraging us. But for us to do that, we've got to strip some of the things from our life. So we've only got a couple more weeks of Advent. So if you're sitting at home, watching your desperate housewives, or the very equivalent of it, for guys, it may be action films and sports, whatever it is that numbs your sensibilities to the gospel that can give you true peace and harmony, maybe spend these next couple weeks of this season and start to employ the very discipline that John the Baptist calls us to so we could receive the very fruits of this season, which will be an overwhelming peace that the hell we, fo- we face today will turn to a heavenly reality of perfect harmony and nothing will disturb me today. Amen.